An astonishing energy, known as Kundalini, is said to lay coiled at the base of the spine, dormant like a sleeping snake. This serpent energy can be woken from its slumber by the practice of certain yoga postures, breathing exercises, and mantras. Aroused by these practices, Kundalini surges upwards through an invisible network of nerves and pierces six lotus-like chakras, releasing waves of ecstasy. When it reaches a magnificent thousand-petaled lotus at the crown of the head, Kundalini is said to merge into pure consciousness and endow the practitioner with enlightenment. What is this extraordinary yoga practice and its so-called serpent energy? And where did these esoteric teachings come from? My name is Swami Tadatmananda. From 1981 onwards, I studied under a traditional Indian guru, Swami Dayananda, who ordained me as a Hindu monk. I'd like to invite you to join me for this unique exploration of Kundalini Yoga. We'll seek out the roots of this tradition and explore the intricacies of its practice. We'll examine certain controversies and misconceptions. And I'll share my own personal experience of practicing Kundalini Yoga. For almost 30 years, I've taught the profound spiritual truths of Advaita Vedanta, the complexities of Sanskrit language, and meditation. Because meditation helped me so much, I developed a great love for leading others to discover its benefits. Over the years, I learned that no single meditation technique is equally effective for all meditators. Every person is unique. For this reason, I teach a wide variety of meditation techniques. But somehow, I've never taught Kundalini Yoga. Why? There are two main reasons. First of all, my guru strenuously warned us about a problem he called experience-seeking. He said that conventional life is driven by the never-ending pursuit of new and better experiences. People love to watch new movies, dine at trendy restaurants, and travel to exotic places. But experiences like these can never lead to perfect peace and contentment. 
As a young man, Swami Dayananda observed the problem of experience seeking when he lived in Rishikesh, a sacred town in the foothills of the Himalayas. In the 1960s, he was sought out by American and European hippies who had indulged in sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and now they wanted to experience meditation. But if meditation is just another experience to be enjoyed, then it's not so different from sex, drugs, or anything else. In this way, some practitioners of Kundalini Yoga might merely be seeking exciting new experiences instead of seeking spiritual growth. It's easy to fall into the trap of experience seeking, especially when this yogic practice seems to hold the promise of bliss and ecstasy. The other reason I've avoided teaching Kundalini Yoga is that I'm completely turned off by the way it's been distorted and misrepresented by contemporary Western yogis. I'm tired of seeing dazzling rainbow-hued chakras and bodies emitting fountains of light from every pore. Images like these portray a practice that has virtually nothing in common with its ancient origins. Yet people seem drawn to glitzy illustrations and trendy New Age beliefs. On the other hand, Kundalini Yoga is an authentic spiritual tradition whose roots go back at least 2,000 years. In ancient India, the holy sages, known as rishis, sought enlightenment by exploring within their bodies and minds to discover the supreme divinity hidden deep inside. Their remarkable insights and the special techniques they devised were recorded in Sanskrit scriptures called Upanishads. A total of 108 Upanishads are included in the Vedas, the main scriptures for all Hindu, religious, and spiritual practices. Twenty of those Upanishads are dedicated to the theory and practice of Kundalini Yoga. Those Yoga Upanishads are the ultimate source for the entire body of teachings on Kundalini Yoga. The separate tradition of Advaita Vedanta, which I follow, is based on 12 other Upanishads, which are focused on gaining spiritual knowledge rather than yogic practice. All 108 Upanishads contain the sacred revelations of the rishis. So, it seems hypocritical for me to study only the 12 Vedantic Upanishads and to ignore the 20 Yoga Upanishads, as I have for decades. I had to admit the narrowness of my studies, and this led me to begin a research project, a project that developed into the film you're watching now. This project has two parts. First, to thoroughly explore the teachings of Kundalini Yoga, relying exclusively on the 20 Yoga Upanishads and studying them in the original Sanskrit along with their Sanskrit commentaries. By setting aside all yogic teachings that evolved later, I can focus on what the rishis themselves taught. The second part of the project is to personally undertake the practice of Kundalini Yoga exactly as the rishis conceived it. When I began this venture, I wondered, what will I discover? Will I hear celestial sounds and see inner visions like some practitioners? More importantly, I wondered if my inquiry would confirm or contradict the teachings of Advaita Vedanta I've followed for so long. Right now, I don't know what the outcome of this experiment will be, but that's the whole idea of an experiment, isn't it? 
This is the book I've been studying in preparation for this project. It contains all 20 Yoga Upanishads and their commentaries. It will serve as a travel guide for the path we're about to explore. I haven't started my formal practice of Kundalini Yoga yet, but when I do, I'll share those experiences with you. Kundalini Yoga became well known in the West largely as a result of a 1967 book in which Gopi Krishna described his amazing experiences of Kundalini. Gopi Krishna was a government employee from North India whose intense meditation had awakened his dormant Kundalini with astonishing and sometimes harrowing results. His book reached the shores of America just at the time when the hippies had taken great interest both in Hindu mysticism and in psychedelic experiences from hallucinogenic drugs like LSD. Gopi Krishna's mind-bending encounters with Kundalini seemed to resemble the LSD experiences of the hippies and this perhaps attracted them to Kundalini Yoga. As a rebellious teenager, I also experimented with LSD way back then, but I didn't read Gopi Krishna's book until years later. When spiritual teachings leave the lands of their origin and are retold in different cultures and in different languages, they're subject to being revised or altered in various ways. Some changes are necessary, like the translation of Sanskrit scriptures into English. But other changes can muddle or distort the meaning of the original texts. And all too often, spiritual teachings become totally corrupted when they're misinterpreted by people whose perspectives are utterly foreign to the originals. For example, a famous book on the seven chakras, written by C.W. Leadbeater, was filled with Western occultism and doctrines of the Theosophical Society, of which Leadbeater was a member. Carl Jung, the famous psychoanalyst, gave a seminar on Kundalini Yoga as a method for individuation, which is a special therapeutic process he devised. More recently, Yogi Bhajan brought his highly personalized version of Kundalini Yoga from India to the United States, replacing its traditional Sanskrit mantras with others from his own Sikh religion. Swami Muktananda also introduced Kundalini Yoga to Westerners, teaching a version extensively adapted by the Kashmiri Shaiva tradition to which he belonged. Now, I don't mean to imply that all these derivative teachings are useless. Many spiritual seekers have benefited from them. I myself meditated with disciples of Swami Muktananda as a young man. But these modern spin-offs are not at all in alignment with what the ancient rishis taught. And as a result, something of great value has been lost. As Kundalini Yoga became more and more integrated into Western culture, it began to lose its original identity, and eventually it was totally reshaped through the process of cultural appropriation. When a Native American war bonnet is donned by a famous model, or when bindis, which are sacred to Hindus, are worn by a popular singer, these cultural forms are appropriated and adapted without due respect for their time-honored traditions. The original meanings of these cultural forms are stripped away 
and replaced by current fashions. Kundalini Yoga has also fallen prey to cultural appropriation. Westernized versions of the chakras present them in hues of the rainbow instead of their traditional colors and associate them with emotions which the rishis never intended. Chakras even get mixed up with other cultures, like this Greek symbol and this ancient Egyptian figure. The New Age movement has commodified the chakras, using them to advertise crystals, colorful stones, scented oils, and self-improvement seminars. On a more serious note, a very damaging adaptation of Kundalini Yoga has arisen due to the problem of experience seeking we discussed before. There's an interesting story about this. Years ago, my guru asked me to drive him to an ashram in New York State to meet an elderly Swami who taught Kundalini Yoga. We were invited into a large room where the guru and his students sat in meditation. After several minutes of perfect silence, one of the meditators suddenly shrieked and her body jerked violently. Swami Dayananda was so startled, he almost fell out of his chair. Over the next half hour, several other meditators had similar reactions. After our visit, I asked Swami Dayananda about this. He said these students were taught that whenever a chakra is pierced, Kundalini will produce spontaneous vocalizations and body movements. This isn't taught in the Yoga Upanishads, but when students are led to believe that occasional shrieks and jerks are sure signs of progress, a suggestion is planted in their minds that can trigger reactions later. Psychologists say that suggestions like these work in the same way as placebos. A patient's trust in a doctor enables a placebo to actually produce desirable effects. Similarly, a student's trust in a guru enables meditation to produce reactions like those we observed. Swami Dayananda was highly critical of the way Kundalini Yoga is usually taught, and he put the blame on the problem of experience seeking. He said many modern gurus put far too much emphasis on gaining spiritual experiences and not enough emphasis on gaining spiritual wisdom. All experiences are temporary, including experiences of Kundalini. After a powerful spiritual experience comes and goes, you might remain utterly unchanged unless you actually learn something from that experience. That's exactly what happened to me when I experimented with LSD as a reckless teenager. I had transcendent experiences and a sense of complete oneness with the cosmos. But after the drug wore off, I found myself no wiser than before. I failed to learn anything from those experiences. For this reason, the ultimate goal of spiritual practice is not to produce short-lived experiences, but rather to reveal the true divine nature of the consciousness within us. According to the ancient rishis, our true nature is divine. It is eternal, limitless, and untouched by worldly affliction. If that's so, why are we still subject to suffering? 
The problem is the inner divinity is covered by a veil of ignorance that obscures it and prevents us from recognizing its nature. The goal of spiritual practice, then, is to remove that ignorance and discover the innate, ever-present divinity within. Look at this passage from the Yoga Tattva Upanishad. Suffering is due to ignorance. Spiritual knowledge frees you from suffering. And that knowledge is to discover the true divine nature of your own consciousness. Enlightenment is the personal discovery of your innate divinity. This discovery takes place when the veil of ignorance is removed. And removing that ignorance requires spiritual knowledge, because knowledge alone destroys ignorance. But then, where does Kundalini Yoga come into the picture? If enlightenment is gained through spiritual knowledge, then what's the point of raising your Kundalini and piercing your chakras? To answer this, we have to discern two distinct factors that are required to accomplish anything, factors the rishis called primary cause and secondary cause. If you want to make rotis for lunch from flour and water, the primary cause is fire, since a fire's heat can bake bread. A stove and pan are also needed, but they don't produce heat, so they're considered secondary causes. For any goal, primary and secondary causes are both necessary. Without a fire, stove, or pan, you won't have any rotis to eat. This demonstrates an important point. Spiritual knowledge is the primary cause for enlightenment because it can remove the veil of ignorance and reveal the divinity within. But yoga is the secondary cause. So, without yoga, enlightenment is impossible. Both spiritual knowledge and yoga are required. As the Yoga Tattva Upanishad says, without yogic practice, how can spiritual knowledge free you from suffering? Without spiritual knowledge, how can yogic practice free you from suffering? Both are required for liberation. Many kinds of yogic practices can help you gain enlightenment, including karma yoga, selfless service, raja yoga, meditation, bhakti yoga, devotion, hatha yoga, postures and breathing exercises, and of course, kundalini yoga. Another important yogic practice closely related to kundalini yoga is pilgrimage, traveling to a sacred place. The goal of pilgrimage is to be blessed by the deity residing in a sacred place, usually inside a special temple. Yet, the rishis taught that the divinity residing in each temple also resides in you, inside your own body. And they envisioned sacred places within the body to be visited through an inner pilgrimage. This inner pilgrimage is a meditation practice in which you deliberately imagine particular deities and sacred places within your body. The Darshana Upanishad says, the Himalayas are at the top of your head, Lord Shiva dwells on your forehead, the sacred city of Varanasi is between your eyebrows, Kurukshetra, where the Mahabharata war was fought, is in your chest, Prayaga, where the sacred Ganga and Yamuna rivers meet, is in your heart. The practice of Kundalini Yoga is a kind of inner pilgrimage. 
It begins at the Muladhara Chakra, at the base of your spine, and concludes at the Sahasrara Chakra, at the crown of your head. During this pilgrimage, you are to meditate on the deity residing in each chakra and receive the blessings needed for your onward journey. Long before modern medical science, the rishis mapped out the life force in our bodies using their powers of intuition. Their pre-scientific model called this life force prana and identified five kinds. Prana in the heart, apana in the trunk of the body, vyana pervading the body, udana in the throat, and samana in the stomach. These five pranas circulate throughout the body following specific roots called nadis. Nadi is often translated as nerve, but it's not a physical tube or conduit. The nadis and pranas are not material in nature. They're subtle, non-tangible. Your brain is tangible. It weighs about two pounds but your mind is not tangible. It has no size or weight. In the same way, the nadis and pranas are non-tangible, subtle, unlike the nerves and blood vessels in your body. There are three main nadis. The sushumna, which rises inside your spine from its base to the crown of your head. The ida, which terminates at your left nostril, and the pingala, which terminates at your right nostril. There are many other nadis in your body. They're said to number 72,000 altogether. The sushumna nadi links together all seven chakras. Chakra means wheel, but they're usually described as lotus flowers. According to the Yoga Chudamani Upanishad, the Muladhara Chakra at the base of the spine has four petals. The Swadishtana Chakra above it has six petals. The Manipura Chakra at the navel has ten petals. The Anahata Chakra at the heart has twelve petals. The Vishuddha Chakra at the throat has 16 petals. The Agnya Chakra between the eyebrows has 2 petals. And the Sahasrara Chakra at the crown of the head has 1,000 petals. Since the chakras are like flowers, they're actually turned upwards, not outwards. Lotus flowers symbolize purity. Even though they're rooted in the slimy, stinking muck at the bottom of a pond, their pristine beauty remains untainted. Even though chakras are located inside an impure human vessel, their sanctity remains untainted. Before we examine the seven chakras in detail, there's an important question we have to consider. Do chakras and nadis actually exist inside our bodies, or are they just concepts envisioned by the rishis long ago? When addressing this question, many scholars and practitioners fall into the trap of treating nadis and chakras identically. Either both are real or both are imagined. But this assumption turns out to be incorrect. First of all, nadis belong to a pre-scientific model of the human nervous system, but the seven chakras are not part of that model. Chakras are not involved in channeling prana throughout the body. Nadis direct the flow of prana, 
not chakras, which serve a very different purpose. To understand how chakras are different, consider this. Nadis are widely referred to in all 108 Upanishads, but chakras are mentioned mostly in the 20 Yoga Upanishads. This shows that chakras have a more specialized role than Nadis, a role specific to the practice of Kundalini Yoga. What is that role? Chakras are richly symbolic forms that have been envisioned by the rishis and deliberately superimposed on the body for the sake of meditation. Like the deities and sacred places in the body imagined during the practice of inner pilgrimage. Deliberate superimposition of this sort is widely used, like when we superimpose the god of the cosmos on statues standing barely three feet tall, or when we superimpose monetary value on little bits of paper. Such symbolism is powerful and useful, as it is in Kundalini Yoga when chakras and their associated deities are deliberately superimposed at locations along the spine to serve as focal points for meditation. Now we can see the difference between nadis and chakras. Nadis are part of a model for the human nervous system, which obviously exists. Chakras, on the other hand, are deliberately superimposed on the body and are to be visualized during meditation. To explain this difference, scholars say that we have to differentiate between descriptive statements and prescriptive statements. Descriptive statements describe the nature of existent things, whereas prescriptive statements prescribe or specify what we should or shouldn't do. When we interpret scriptures, it's crucial to correctly determine which statements are descriptive and which are prescriptive. But it's not always obvious. One Upanishad says, The human body is a leather sack filled with stinking pus, urine, and feces. This is not a descriptive statement, because its intent is not to give a factual description of the body. This is a prescriptive statement, because its aim is to prescribe detachment towards our bodies and those of our loved ones. When the rishis portrayed the seven chakras, their intent was not to describe objects that actually exist in the body. Rather, they prescribed a practice in which chakras, deliberately superimposed on the body, were to be visualized for the sake of meditation. Of course, not everyone agrees with this, Many modern practitioners believe that chakras truly exist inside their bodies. Fortunately, this belief is extremely helpful in the practice of Kundalini Yoga. To believe in the divinity of a three-foot-tall statue on an altar helps people pray. To believe that these little bits of paper are valuable helps us buy things. And to believe that chakras truly exist inside the body helps practitioners meditate. All these beliefs are helpful. The value of a belief is not in its veracity, but in its ability to help us. Beliefs are not right or wrong. They are helpful or harmful. And to believe in the existence of chakras is an exceedingly helpful belief, one that need not be challenged or dismissed.
The word Kundalini means coiled, and Shakti means power or energy. The rishis prescribed visualizing Kundalini Shakti as a powerful serpent coiled up at the base of the spine. <laughs> Why a serpent? Because they're powerful. Without arms or legs, they move swiftly and strike fiercely. And snakes are deeply revered in Hindu culture. After shedding their skin, they're figuratively reborn and therefore associated with the rebirth of human souls. Serpents also play important roles in many popular mythological stories. Kundalini Shakti is best understood in its philosophical context. The creation of the universe is said to result from the union of Shiva, the masculine principle, and Shakti, the feminine principle. Here, Shiva and Shakti are not the four-armed deities familiar to Hindus. Shiva is the fabric of reality that gives existence to everything like clay gives existence to pots and bowls. Because clay is inert, a separate creative force is needed to transform it into various objects. Similarly, Shiva lacks the creative force needed to produce the universe. Only when Shiva is accompanied by Shakti's infinite creative power can the universe arise. Shakti infuses everything in the cosmos with energy, including every atom in your body. In this way, Shakti is present within you, and it is this inner presence that is called Kundalini Shakti. If Kundalini Shakti is dormant, sleeping at the base of your spine, then how is it to be awakened? The Yoga Kundali Upanishad says, the sleeping Kundalini is to be awakened by agitating it, like hitting a snake with a stick. It then stands erect and enters the Sushumna Nadi like a snake entering its burrow. To awaken Kundalini Shakti, the Yoga Upanishads prescribe a variety of asanas, pranayamas, and muscle contractions known as bandhas. It's interesting that a method known as Shaktipat is not discussed anywhere in the Upanishads. Shaktipat is a special blessing from a guru, like a mantra or even a mere touch or glance that is said to immediately awaken your kundalini. The use of Shaktipat is widely accepted by modern teachers even though the rishis never mentioned it. Once Kundalini Shakti has been awakened and starts its ascent, some practitioners, like Gopi Krishna, report having amazing experiences. Mystical visions, celestial sounds, ecstasy. But if the chakras and kundalini serpent were deliberately superimposed by the rishis and don't truly exist, then how could these experiences arise? For practitioners who strongly believe that the chakras and kundalini serpent actually exist inside their bodies, the mind's marvelous power of suggestion is certainly capable of producing such experiences. The practice of Kundalini Yoga reaches its climax when Kundalini finally ascends to the Sahasrara Chakra. The Yoga Kundali Upanishad says, Having pierced the six chakras, Kundalini Shakti merges with Shiva at the thousand-petaled lotus at the crown of the head. That is the supreme state. That is the cause for liberation. 
This verse is easily misinterpreted unless we bear in mind our earlier discussions. Some contend that kundalini yoga is a self-sufficient means for liberation or enlightenment. But all forms of yoga, including kundalini yoga, are secondary causes for enlightenment. To get enlightened through kundalini yoga alone is like making rotis with a pan and stove, but no fire. The primary cause for enlightenment is spiritual knowledge, which removes the veil of ignorance and reveals your true nature. Kundalini helps you gain that knowledge by leading you to a state of meditative absorption known as samadhi. Samadhi is the goal of many meditation techniques, and for good reason. In that state of absorption, all distracting mental activities are removed, and all that remains is you, your true nature, stripped of everything that's not you. After emerging from samadhi, you have an opportunity to grasp a life-changing lesson from that unique experience. That your true nature is pure consciousness, utterly independent of your body, mind, and the world around you. In this way, the state of samadhi produced by kundalini yoga can be a gateway to enlightenment. As the Trishiki Brahmana Upanishad says, a yogi whose mind is absorbed gains liberation as effortlessly as a berry already in the palm of his hand. We've just completed a rather complex inquiry. Next, we'll focus on the actual practice of Kundalini Yoga. So far, we've been studying the guidebook for the inner pilgrimage mapped out by the rishis. Now, it's time for us to begin the actual journey and follow in their footsteps by practicing Kundalini Yoga as they themselves conceived it. This is where I meditate every day. I usually start with prayer and devotional meditation, which help balance the lofty Vedantic meditations I practice next. Starting tomorrow, I'm going to set aside this routine and focus exclusively on the practice of Kundalini Yoga. You can join me in this practice by using the teachings that follow as a guide. I'm eager to begin this new adventure, but when I reflect on my guru's negative comments about kundalini yoga, I feel a bit uneasy. If he were still alive, I might not have undertaken this project. Our inner pilgrimage begins with the muladhara chakra at the base of the spine. Mula means root, and this chakra is the root or starting place for this practice. Each of the lowest five chakras represent one of the five elements known in ancient times. Earth, water, fire, air, and space. From the most gross, earth, to the most subtle, space. Inside the Muladhara chakra, the element earth is represented by a yellow square. It's interesting that the Yoga Upanishad specify colors for each of the five elements, but they say nothing about the color of each chakra. The colors used here are based on later scriptural traditions. You'll often see Sanskrit letters adorning the petals of each chakra, but these letters aren't mentioned in the Yoga Upanishads. They were a later addition. The Yoga Upanishads do specify mantras, not for the chakras, but for each of the five elements. Lam is the mantra for the element earth. 
Chakras are often depicted with these mantras drawn inside, but mantras are for recitation, not for visualization. Each chakra is the abode of a particular deity to be meditated upon during one's inner pilgrimage. For the Muladhara chakra, the deity is Brahma, God in its aspect as creator of the universe. The Muladhara or root chakra is associated both with the element earth, the root of all matter, and with Brahma, the root of existence itself. In meditation, Brahma is to be visualized according to the scriptures, seated on a lotus with four arms and four heads. I've just finished my first meditation. For many years, I focused my attention between my eyebrows. So, it wasn't difficult to concentrate on the base of the spine instead. With my attention fixed there, I visualized the Muladhara Chakra while reciting the Earth Mantra, Lam. I reflected on how the element Earth is the basis for my physical existence, for every atom in my body. Then, I imagined Brahma residing in the Chakra and I settled into a deeply prayerful mood, feeling God's divine presence within me. The ability to become deeply absorbed in devotion is one of the many benefits of regular meditation. I find this prayerful state very nurturing and healing. In that state, I sought Brahma's blessings for success on the journey that's just begun. In order to proceed, we have to consult the Yoga Chudamani Upanishad, which says, Within the Muladhara Chakra is a yoni, and within that yoni is a great linga. The words yoni and linga often denote the female and male sex organs. But here, yoni means kundalini shakti, the feminine principle we discussed before, and the word linga signifies Shiva as pure consciousness, the masculine principle. In the Muladhara Chakra, Kundalini Shakti is depicted as a powerful serpent, and Shiva is depicted as a rounded linga encircled by that serpent. Intimate contact between a serpent and linga is said to generate heat or fire. According to the rishis, certain yogic practices can kindle that fire until it becomes hot enough to wake up the dormant kundalini serpent and drive it out of the muladhara chakra, upwards into the sushumna nadi which emerges from the top. To kindle the fire in the Muladhara Chakra, the Yoga Upanishads prescribe several asanas, pranayamas, and bandhas. One is Mula Bandha, which entails contracting the muscles at the anus. Another is a kind of pranayama known as Bhastrika, which involves rapid, forceful exhalations, together with pulsations of the abdomen muscles. These techniques are said to force prana into the Muladhara Chakra, fanning the flame, so to speak, to produce enough heat to force the Kundalini upwards. In tomorrow's meditation, I'll try these techniques. While meditating today, I visualized a roaring fire inside the Muladhara Chakra, as I practiced Mula Bandha. After each inhalation, I briefly retained my breath and contracted the sphincter muscles. After a while, those muscles got tired, so I switched to Bhastrika Pranayama. It's often called bellows breath because of its vigorous exhalations. Bellows are used to force air into a fire to raise its temperature. 
Bhastrika pranayama certainly raised my temperature. It's very energizing. With each exhalation, I also pulsed my abdomen muscles, which shook the organs inside the trunk of my body where the muladhara chakra is located. This shaking is said to help wake up the serpent sleeping there. Have you ever noticed how sensations like itches, hunger, and thirst become stronger when you focus your attention on them? That's due to the power of suggestion, which can actually be used as a valuable tool for meditation. Long ago, I found that by concentrating my attention anywhere in my body, like between my eyebrows, I could produce various sensations there. Today, as I visualized a fire blazing away in the Muladhara Chakra, I began to feel a sense of warmth at the base of my spine. This physical sensation arose due to the combined effects of Muladhara, Bhastrika Pranayama, and the power of suggestion. Since Kundalini Yoga is based on chakras that have been deliberately superimposed, the power of suggestion is crucial for its effectiveness. Skillful meditators intentionally wield this power in their practice. For those meditators who believe that chakras truly exist inside their bodies, the power of suggestion works unconsciously and it's actually strengthened by their beliefs, making their practice more effective than for someone like me who doesn't share their beliefs. Such is the nature of the power of suggestion. Each day I practice, the sense of warmth at the base of my spine seems to grow more intense. So, today, I shifted the point of my concentration upwards, away from the Muladhara Chakra and towards the Swadishtana Chakra above it. Not surprisingly, the sense of warmth at the base of my spine also moved upwards. Could this modest experience be the initial ascent of Kundalini Shakti? Shouldn't it be something more dramatic? Some practitioners report having intense and even tumultuous experiences when Kundalini begins its ascent. But every practitioner is different. Besides, what rises from chakra to chakra is energy like heat, not a snake. The snake is a deliberate superimposition of the rishis who prescribed that meditators should shift their point of concentration upwards from one chakra to the next. Yet, for many practitioners, Kundalini seems to begin its ascent spontaneously and continue to rise without any deliberate effort whatsoever. All such experiences could certainly be brought about by the mind's power of suggestion. Today, I began to meditate on the Swadishtana Chakra. Since my Kundalini has apparently begun its ascent, there's no need to kindle the fire in the Muladhara Chakra anymore. So, I stopped practicing Mula Bandha and Bhastrika Pranayama. Instead, I visualized the Swadishtana Chakra, also known as the Sacral Chakra. Swadishtana means the seat of existence. And this chakra is fittingly located at your seat, the sacrum. It has six petals, and is associated with the element water, which is represented by a white crescent moon. Vam is the mantra for the element water. The deity abiding in this chakra is Vishnu, God in its aspect as sustainer of the universe. Just as the element water sustains life, 
Vishnu sustains the world. Vishnu is generally depicted with blue skin and four arms. I visualized the Swadishtana Chakra while reciting the water mantra Vam and reflecting on how water sustains my life. Then I imagined Vishnu residing in the chakra and once again I settled into a deeply prayerful mood. Today, after visualizing the Swadishtana Chakra, as I did yesterday, I became aware of the sense of warmth at my sacrum. The sensation grew stronger when I focused on it more intensely. And when I shifted my attention upwards towards the Manipura Chakra, the sense of warmth also climbed upwards. I'm a bit surprised to progress from chakra to chakra so quickly, but it's likely that all my prior meditation practice has helped me a lot. For the past two days, I've been meditating on the Manipura Chakra. Manipura means abode of gems. It's also called Nabhi Chakra because it's located behind the Nabhi or navel. It's not accurate to call it Solar Plexus Chakra because that plexus is located well above the navel. The Manipura Chakra has 10 petals and is associated with the element fire, which is represented by a red triangle. Ram is the mantra for the element fire. The deity abiding in this chakra is Rudra, a fierce aspect of Shiva, usually depicted as a warrior or hunter. In meditation, I visualized the Manipura chakra and recited the fire mantra, Ram. When I reflected on the element fire, it became obvious how the expression fire in the gut made its way into the English language. This region seems to be associated with power, will, and assertiveness. I could sense these qualities with my attention focused there. It's no surprise that a powerful deity like Rudra abides in the Manipura Chakra. For me, meditating on Rudra is like watching a violent thunderstorm that evokes great awe and respect mixed with a little bit of fear. In today's meditation, after visualizing the Manipura Chakra, I focused on a sense of warmth behind my navel. As before, the more I observed it, the stronger it grew. Then I shifted my attention upwards to the center of my chest where the Anahata Chakra is located. The sense of warmth rose from the navel and gradually expanded, filling my chest. For three days now, I've been meditating on the Anahata Chakra, the so-called Heart Chakra, located along the spine at chest level. Anahata means that which cannot be struck, injured, or killed, referring to one's soul. This chakra has 12 petals and is associated with the element air, aptly so being near the lungs. The element air is represented by a smoky, six-pointed figure. Yum is the mantra for the element air. The deity abiding in the Anahata Chakra is a beneficent form of Shiva, depicted as looking in all directions simultaneously, to bless everyone. Shiva is often called God of Destruction, but it might be more accurate to call him God of transformation, purification, 
and growth, since all these depend on the destruction of a prior condition so a new and better state can arise. When I visualized the Anahata Chakra, my attention was drawn to the air passing into and out of my lungs. Air is constantly in motion, and it's this movement of air that fills us with life. When I meditated on Shiva, I felt deeply grateful for the gift of life we receive with each and every breath. In today's meditation, I focused on the sense of warmth that filled my chest. Once again, it grew stronger and rose when I shifted my attention upwards to my throat, where the Vishuddha Chakra is located. I've completed two more meditations focusing on the Vishuddha Chakra located at the throat. Vishuddha means pure, untainted. This chakra has 16 petals and is associated with the element space, which is represented by a transparent circle. Hum is the mantra for this element. The deity abiding in the Vishuddha Chakra is the bi-gendered form of Shiva, whose right side is male and left side is female. This form of Shiva reminds us that none of us are exclusively male or female. Nature is exuberant in its diversity and avoids such absolute divisions. Meditating on this form helped me accept feminine qualities which are as much a part of me as the masculine ones. In today's meditation, I observed the sense of warmth in my throat, and as before, it moved upwards when I shifted my attention to the Agnya Chakra, between my eyebrows. Agnya means a command or order, which shows this chakra's association with the mind, our so-called command center. Even though the Agnya Chakra is located between the eyebrows, to call it third eye chakra is problematic, since the Yoga Upanishads make no references to a third eye. The Agnya Chakra is completely different from the others. It's not associated with a particular deity or any of the five elements. And since it's not associated with an element, it has no mantra, although later traditions associate it with the mantra Om. The Agnya Chakra stands at the threshold between the five elemental chakras in the body below and the transcendent Sahasrara Chakra above. From the Muladhara upwards, each chakra has an increasing number of petals, but the Agnya has only two. The Yoga Upanishads are curiously silent about symbolic meanings for these petals. In fact, the rishis provide surprisingly few details about any of the chakras. Many of the details and the elaborate symbolism that exists today was established by later generations of yogis and compiled into Sanskrit texts like the famous 16th century work Exposition of the Six Chakras. The rishis seem to have deliberately left many details up to the imagination of practitioners. And this suggests that the rishis' creative use of deliberate superimposition could legitimately be used by later practitioners as well. Based on this, modern adaptations like rainbow-hued chakras could certainly be considered acceptable. So, 
I have to reconsider my earlier condemnation of what I called distortions and misrepresentations of contemporary Western yogis. If a particular adaptation is truly helpful for practitioners, then it need not be criticized. But we can't be naive. Not all adaptations are helpful. Some might even be detrimental, like modifications introduced by unqualified teachers, or by gurus with ulterior motives, like those who charge a fee for shaktipat. Okay, let's return to the Agnya Chakra. Even though the rishis don't specify a deity for this chakra, they do prescribe visualizing a linga of light, by which they mean a form of Shiva as pure consciousness within the Agnya Chakra. I'm back on familiar ground now because meditating on pure consciousness is central to Advaita Vedanta. But there's a misnomer here. You can't actually meditate on consciousness because, as the meditator, you are that very consciousness. You can only meditate on objects in your mind which are illumined by the light of consciousness. So, in Vedanta, to meditate on consciousness means to meditate on the meditator. That is, to reflect on your own essential nature as pure consciousness. Today, while visualizing the Agnya Chakra between my eyebrows, I reflected on how my mental image of a two-petaled lotus can be observed by me because it's illumined by consciousness the same pure consciousness which is my true nature. That consciousness is utterly independent of the mind, body, and world. It transcends them all. Having reached this lofty perspective, I think I'm ready for the final stage of practice, when Kundalini Shakti ascends to the Sahasrara Chakra. Sahasra means 1,000, which is the number of petals in the Sahasrara Chakra at the crown of the head. The rishis give no further details about this chakra. In fact, in many texts, the Sahasrara is not considered a chakra at all. It lies beyond the chakras, outside the body. It's usually depicted on the outer surface of the head, not within it. In Hindu scripture, the number 1000 stands for infinity, suggesting that the Sahasrara Chakra is infinite in height and breadth, infinite in brilliance, infinite in splendor. When Kundalini Shakti finally reaches this limitless expanse, its amazing journey is complete. According to the rishis, after ascending to the Sahasrara Chakra, Kundalini Shakti merges into pure consciousness and loses its individuality altogether. But the rishis say little about the meaning and symbolism of this climactic event, because its significance is best understood through meditation itself, not through words. I began today's meditation by visualizing the Agnya Chakra and focusing on the sense of warmth between my eyebrows. I allowed that sensation to grow stronger and then shifted my attention upwards towards the top of my head. As before, the sense of warmth moved upwards, but while rising, it changed into a brilliant light that seemed to fill my head and body and radiate beyond as well. 
Then, almost immediately, that light faded and my mind became profoundly silent. I fell into a state of absorption, samadhi, just like I had many times before using other techniques. Samadhi is somewhat like being blissfully immersed in deep sleep, except that you remain fully awake. When you wake up from sleep, you know you slept. When you emerge from samadhi, you know you were absorbed. Anyone who experiences samadhi for the first time will find it a great achievement. And anyone who discovers their true nature to be pure consciousness, utterly independent of the mind, body, and world, will find this recognition to be absolutely life-changing. Without doubt, many practitioners of Kundalini Yoga have reached these great heights and were blessed by their efforts. But my prior practice has already blessed me in these ways, so my experience of Kundalini's triumphant ascent seemed to lack the tremendous intensity that other practitioners describe. Also, I have a hunch that if I firmly believed in the actual existence of chakras, my experiences might have been far more intense. But then again, the ultimate goal of this practice is not to produce rapturous experiences, but to support the attainment of spiritual knowledge, enlightenment. I've learned a lot from this experiment. I've discovered how Advaita Vedanta and Kundalini Yoga are actually complementary to each other. I've learned to be less critical of modern adaptations, like rainbow-colored chakras. And I've made friends with this often misunderstood serpent. <laughs> Will I start teaching Kundalini Yoga to my students now? I don't think so. This technique is rather complex, so it needs lots of time to learn and practice. More than that, Kundalini Yoga seems like a difficult way to gain a state of absorption that can more easily be reached through other techniques. But then, if there are easier paths to samadhi, why is Kundalini Yoga so widely taught? Its popularity is very likely in response to the problem of experience seeking. The pursuit of worldly experiences can prevent people from seeking spiritual growth. But if Kundalini Yoga promises them exciting new experiences, they might consider practicing it. Then their practice could lead them to realize that something far more valuable than exciting experiences is within reach. Such a recognition could wean them away from experience seeking and incline them to pursue enlightenment instead. This so-called bait-and-switch approach might have led many practitioners to find perfect peace and lasting contentment. If so, the ability to transform those captivated by worldly experience into genuine spiritual seekers could be the most extraordinary feature of Kundalini Yoga.